I know you guys are all getting settled in, but at this time, I would like to invite to the stage our next panel. So they will be talking about successful programming beyond the library. And this panel is gonna be moderated by Chris Oda. Hello, Chris. Hi. And joining him today, we'll have Nick Tanzi, who did our keynote. And you know he'll be talking a little bit more about some of the technical programming. We've got Caitlin Lung from Livermore Public Library, and we have Ben Fernandez from the San Jose Public Library. So let's give them a minute to get set up, and then we'll get started. So when we, when we have you go up for um, your presentation, are you both going to stand at the podium? Yes. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And it looks like we also have Padmashri here. Thank you, Padmashri, also with San Jose Public Library. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys had a great lunch, and I hope you're enjoying the program so far. All right. My name is Chris Oda, and I'm on the PLP Staff Development Committee. And uh, if your organization is not representing themselves on the committee, then think about joining because it's a really good way to work cooperatively and do some event planning skills. First, some jokes. Why are libraries the tallest buildings in the world? Because they have so many stories. Oh my gosh. I made that joke up. Why did the cardiologist recommend his patients go to the library? He heard they're good for circulation. <laughs> How do librarians flirt with you? They ask you for your call number. <laughs> Libraries have a history of going outside its walls to reach the public. To reach non-users, or that's, that's been our goal, is to go out and reach, get out there in the community and reach the non-users, all right? Think about a community of non-English speaking groups that live in, a, in an enclave and they don't visit the library. We go out there, we tell them, hey, this is, our, this is what we got, these are our resources. We sign them up for library cards, visit us. Give them e-resources. Think of a senior community where the residents, they just can't make it to the library because of they don't drive or because they're just physically not able. Well, you. You send a librarian out there with a collection. You teach them how to get onto the to the to the to ebooks and streaming. Think about a business campus where these workers are spending long days. They're just working and they're unable to make it to the library. So you send a mobile vehicle to them and you have them check out a book so that at the end of the day they open up the book and they're 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 enriched and they're just taking a little bit of time away from their phones. All right, the pandemic hit, and people became disconnected, and we had to close down our buildings. So some libraries went out into open spaces, and they met the people where it was safe, where everyone felt comfortable and socially distanced, and we sat six feet apart. It was weird. <laughs> and, some, and some of us keep going out, even after society reopened. So to talk about that now, I'm going to bring up from Livermore Public Library, Caitlin Lung. A little shorter there. Okay. Hello. My name is Caitlin, and I'm a librarian with the Livermore Public Library. Um, I am a branch librarian, but also I work closely with um, other outside organizations in order to bring library programming to Livermore's community um, at large. So, um, I'm sure a lot of you experienced this. I know I did, but uh, during the COVID-19 shutdown, um, we 
I saw a lot of turnover. So everybody that I had been working with before in um, the park districts, which is what I'm gonna focus this presentation on, um, they either retired or moved on to different positions. Um, basically all my contacts were gone. Um, so I essentially had to start over. And um, it was a challenge, especially trying to find the right people to contact. Um, a good place to start for this if you are reestablishing uh, connections or if you are just starting from scratch is to ask your colleagues. Maybe they've worked with people before um, in other capacities and they might be able to direct you to someone in um, a potential partner organization um, that could help you. You could also, um, Find your friends of the friend, your friends of friends. Um, so, for instance, in uh, the top left picture there, um, that was at the local school district's science fair night, um, and uh, they invite all sorts of different community partners to the science fair that have science type um, um, interests and. Um, my table just happened to be right there next to the park rangers. <laughs> so if you don't already have those connections, um, it would be, be a great idea for you to um, take a look at um, um, other events that you participate in and see who is, uh, who's there, who you can uh, buddy up to and um, introduce yourself to. Um, but if that doesn't work, sometimes you just kind of have to make a totally not staged cold call. <laughs> <laughs> um, so find the contact information on the, um, on the organization's website. You might need to fill out a form, send an email to info at parkdistrict.com um, or whatever that is. Another great way to do that is look to see um, for the, the, look for the programming that the other organization is doing on their end. So, um, for instance, I work with two uh, park districts, the Livermore Area Recreational Park District and also the um, East Bay Regional Parks. And um, at least for the Livermore Parks, uh, henceforth LARPD, um, at least for them, um, when they publish their newsletter, they put the email address of the specific um, ranger who's doing the program in the um, little blurb for the program. So if you get in contact with some of these um, um, rangers or um, other programming people in that way, um, it's a great way for you to start establishing those connections. And the first one I want to bring up um, with the LARPD, uh, we've actually been doing this program since uh, 2015. So basically just after I became a librarian in Livermore, um, we started in with this program and um, it takes part, it takes place at a local open space park, which with um, lovely uh, trails, there's a creek, there's native gardens, it's really cool. And what I do is um, I read a book, I sing some songs, um, li the library handles the event registration, and um, then the rangers, they provide an activity um, and information about nature related to the uh, topic we have agreed upon um, in the past. Um, so they range from, um, we, we're doing one in November, that's gonna be about migratory birds. Um, the one up top there is one we've done every year, um, Creekside Storytime. Um, so the rangers, their activities, they give the kids little strainers and buckets and stuff and let them go wild in the creek <laughs> with supervision, of course. And um, we you know, read a water themed story. Um, sometimes Smokey Bear makes an appearance. Um, but it's a great way to get people outside of the library and um, it invites the, the people who might be more park users rather than library users to kind of pay attention to what we're doing too. <laughs> Um, another one we've been doing with the um, LARPD is story time in the park. Now, we actually had something like this planned pre-COVID. It was supposed to be like March or April um, of 2020, um, and it was supposed to be a one-off. It was um, intended to be a celebration of the um, a brand new park that opened adjacent to one of our branch libraries. And it was gonna be like a um, welcome to the new park, check out the library, ton of fun but the world shut down and that didn't happen. Um, but never really let go of the idea because a lot of times, post pandemic, um, or as we were starting to open up again, um, a lot of people were really enjoying the outdoor portions of our uh, programming. Um, we had been doing story time at the library outdoors and 
during the nice weather, we are still doing programming um, and story times outdoors. But our Saturday story times were you know, modestly attended, um, 30, 40 people. Um, the 2022 summer reading um, theme from iReads was honestly a great way for us to make that uh, transition even farther afield. Um, it was, you know, read beyond the beaten path. So we got in contact with the um, LARPD. For this one, I work directly with the outreach coordinator. And what he does is he just, he picks parks, he picks dates, and tells me where to go. And I just bring story time to all these neighborhood parks. So we just have a field. We have the people bring their blankets, sit down. I do story time just like I would at the library. And then afterwards, the um, kids play in the playground. The adults sit and chat. And it's a great time. And we've been getting during, like, um, when the weather's nice, more than 100 people come, come to these things. Um, and it's been remarkable just how great of a um, uh, um, feedback we've been getting from these programs because people love them. And it's a great way for people to experience different parts of the, um, of the community because a lot of times we get families who just like, walk across the street and they're at the park and they go to story time and it's great. Um, a quick side note, if you are planning to do any um, programming outside of your library where people might not expect the library to be, I highly recommend investing in one of these outreach flags. Um, a couple hundred bucks, we got the funding from our friends organization, but um, it's a great way to let people know that, no, this isn't a birthday party, this is the library, and you're welcome to join us, please do. <laughs> um, with the East Bay Parks, um, we've done for the past two years, summer science, and um, they actually contacted me about this one. They saw the work that I was doing with the LARPD, and they said, hey, you already work with the park district, why don't you work with us too? There are um, there's parks in Livermore, and in fact, the um, Del Val Regional Park recently had a brand new visitor center be, be constructed, and they were trying to get people more aware of the new visitor center and of all the interpretive programming they were doing, and they were having trouble reaching people, and they thought, hey, you guys have some good reach. We've got, you know, some work to do um, in trying to get people to come to the new visitor center, so let's partner up and do something together. So. Um, they contacted us, and you can see from the map there, Del Val, while still in Livermore, is, is a bit of a trek um, outside of town. It takes um, about 15, 16 minutes to get to from the library, and that's on the edge of town anyway, too. So um, we go out with them. I share a story, um, maybe some songs, or the uh, rangers might uh, share a song. The picture up top there is um, them sharing heads, shoulders, knees, and toes, except uh, the fish version, where the, where the fins are. It was very cute. <laughs> but we do a different science and nature activity. Um, and these are actually aimed at elementary school children. And um, we, we take care of the registration, um, just so that all of the um, we make sure we have enough supplies for everybody, enough space. Um, and again, for this one, they contacted me, but um, for subsequent years and subsequent programs, we um, coordinate directly with the naturalists and rangers over there. Um, but with those, uh, with those relationships established, we can bring it back to the library. So um, up top there, we've got uh, one of our LARPD rangers joining us at um, our Children's Day, uh, Day of the Book celebration at the library. Um, we also, that, um, bottom picture is from a program um, last week. <laughs> we had the East Bay Parks Rangers come to the library and um, introduce the kids to Harry the tarantula, a uh, live tarantula they caught in the park and uh, were sharing information about. Um, and it was really great. It's a great way to um, kind of um, invite the park people back to the library and um, get us out and about um, meeting people where they are in town, but also in places they might not expect us to be. And there is my contact information if you want to get in touch with me later. Thank you, Caitlin. All right. <clears throat> um, so we'll do Q&A after um, we do three uh, presentations. Um, so libraries, uh, they, they, have, uh, they get funding opportunities uh, to obtain advanced technology, and they can take it out into the community where students can get hands-on experience with it, and they can uh, 
They can find enrichment in STEAM programs. So adding more exposure to science and engineering and making the future brighter. <laughs> so we're going to bring up from San Jose Public Library uh, Benjamin Fernandez and Padmashri Gade uh, to tell us about their makerspace vehicle. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you all for having us here. Uh, we're honored to be here today, and uh, we want to thank you, uh, the committee for inviting us and having us host for the panel. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity, and we are excited to talk about the Maker Spaceship. Um, my name is Benjamin, and my colleague? Padma Gade. So we are the team for the expanded learning unit, the Maker Spaceship. Yes, we are currently from the San Jose Public Library, and we work at Martin Luther King at the Expanded Learning Unit. Um, the Maker Spaceship is the library's flagship um, mobile classroom for science and technology. We drive it all over San Jose, and we, um, we um, bring technology and STEM learning to the community. The program was developed by Aaron Berman, who was our former uh, innovations manager for SJPL, and uh, Maker Spaceship was launched in 2016. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So the Maker, the Maker Spaceship has been on the road for six years, and we've received positive response from the community. During that span, we have developed strong partnerships with our school districts, nonprofit organizations after school programs and city council members. Our team consists of four members. Our manager is Lauren Hancock, who oversees the expanded learning unit. I'm the library clerk for the unit, and I'm the lead driver for the maker spaceship. I handle the logistical duties um, and maintenance for the ship, and I also handle the communications and requests that we receive from our partners. I also um, help with event planning, scheduling, and when we're on site, I'm supporting uh, Padmashi and our librarians with programming and also assisting the children with their projects. And Ms. Padmashi is currently our program librarian and she is on site with me. And when we do our programs, she hosts a variety of programs such as science story times, engineering challenges, coding programs, and many more. So the way we do it, we uh, make a program menu every uh, half year, and we send it out to the schools when we're coordinating them, so the schools uh, can choose which um, program is applicable for the classes. Um, we go to the schools. Um, the ship is out on the road three to four days a week, mostly uh, to schools, and uh, twice a month we do community outreach events. Sue Kim is our part-time librarian, and she helps us with programming, implements new creative programs. And we also want to acknowledge Elizabeth Allen, who has transferred to the branch, but she worked with us for five years, and she had left behind amazing programs for the Maker Spaceship, and we want to acknowledge her as well. So the vehicle is... Um, state-of-the-art technology uh, funded by the Library um, Foundation in the city of San Jose. It has a collection of maker equipment, uh, including robotics, 3D printing, laser cutter, vinyl cutter, uh, microscopes, Apple devices, and laptops with its latest software. Uh, this slideshow shows current, our current 3D printing program, uh, the TAS Sidekick. And during that program, we have the machine running uh, for our students to see in action, and we provide laptops for them to um, introduce them to 3D design. On this slide, we have the, our laser cutter in action. We introduce our students to laser engraving, teach them about how laser is uh, created, um, how carbon dioxide and electricity combined together creates that beam, that laser beam, and um, with the reflection on the mirrors allows the, the laser to cut and etch wood. Um, 
And this is a program that usually is one of our popular programs. And then here, um, students design their own template. We give them a, and with using the template, they create the images, and then it's either etched, and then and they can cut out, either make book box, and that's what we make over there with laser cut. This is another one where we have um, a microscope program for the children to explore um, the outdoors. Uh, they can bring in leaves, see the different kinds of um, uh, different objects or the cell sets. We have a set of uh, made slides that they can see and also draw because what is biology? It's all about seeing and um, representing it. Then you also have, um, in the second uh, image, you're teaching them the engineering design cycle um, so that they understand. And on the ship, they ha do hands-on activity with those. Um, again, here, um, different kinds of, we have programs for the very young too. You have the different magnifying lenses for the very young to see, and for the adults, the higher end of microscopes. So the majority of our visits are with public schools, and we have established MOU agreements with them that allows us to visit and host programs either inside the bus or in the classroom. Um, aside from school, we also go to after-school programs, and on weekends, we're invited to community events. Uh, here's, on, here's a slide where Ms. Padmashree is hosting our program inside the classroom. We are hosting an engineering design challenge with the students. Uh, allowing them to uh, create their design, present it in front of the class uh, um, for collaboration. Um, here we teach them the engineering, they're doing hands-on, um, working as a group with hands-on activity, knowing the criteria and constraints, and they, at the end, they present their, this thing and everybody shared their experience. So this is where uh, children are excited. The materials are the same, everything being seen, no two designs, or the outcomes are the same. You see the creativity being expanded. Here, um, we had a uh, coding 5K challenge. A city had had a coding 5K challenge. We met the challenge, but um, we also, in partnership with the Apple grant, we do have Apple iPads um, and uh, coding programs going through. So this, um, uh, we now, on the Maker Spaceship, we do have iPads where we teach um, everybody can create, everybody can learn to code. Here what you're seeing is students are learning how to um, learn to code with Swift. So in the 45 minutes programs, the students, we tell them how, what coding is, what it is and works. And in the first 45 programs, they finish the first module of commands. Some students are uh, familiar and they go into the chapter of functions. We also encourage them, they can do it on their own at the devices. If not, they can come down to the library and borrow iPads too. Here we're, we hosted a robotics program for the students using Dash uh, and the software Blockly. So students are uh, given opportunity to uh, code. First, uh, very, for the very young, we give them the devices so they can navigate and get excited about robotics. As the little higher middle school students, we teach them the coding with Blockly. So these are some uh, pictures of those. This is another one. This is a structural engineering program that they are doing. Uh, they are given uh, supplies, and for the very young, they can build their own, working in teams. Uh, and for the uh, higher grade, middle elementary one school, elementary school students, we give them the uh, tell them the criteria, constraints, and they do three uh, challenges. And after each challenge, they share their uh, designs, and that's what that will help them improve for the next challenge. So these are some examples of um, structural engineering. Um, this is another one for the very young we take. The first image on the top is about um, Code and Go Mice, uh, unplugged coding activity, which is very popular with all the people who come on, uh, on the board. Just introduce them to coding, a simple way, unplugged activity. And um, the other one over there, give them the supplies and give them a topic and ask them to build their own vehicles. So that's what you see the child being there creative with the supplies building their own future vehicles. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we saw a community needed uh, to bridge the digital divide and our city, uh, city of San Jose and the library said we, we gave out um, hotspots. We were, library was giving hotspots. We also saw that the maker spaceship could be an integral part, so the mobile maker spaceship took out the hotspots, which was um, part of SJ Access, 
and distributed to the communities which were far to reach. So um, this was very popular, where people who didn't know but really needed it got to have the um, hotspots and borrowed the hotspots from the library. And also during the pandemic, we hosted our programs outside. So we would still bring the ship to the site, but because of COVID, we couldn't be too, too close. So we would have our programs outside the ship. Here to, um, you see all these students who have finished a program on the ship and taking a group photo. So we want to, how do we make it an impact in the community? We give hands-on learning f as fun activities, fun as learning activities. We also bridge the, um, remove the commute um, for schools because we go to the schools, the, um, removing the barriers of commu uh, commuting because if they have to go to a tech inter interactive or other museums, it takes them time. So the teachers really appreciate that we are making it easy, to, easy, easy for them to come and having programs which is fun and learning. Of course, to the end, we, we, library has a um, partnership with the schools where they get their own library, student library card. We connect back, don't stop this here, this is just the beginning. Come back to the library, follow your passion, you are all great, so that's what we build our resources back to them, put them in the children's hand. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, uh, now for our final presentation, ebooks and streaming content are now as ubiquitous to libraries as patron barcodes and physical books. So much content is in the digital realm, and so how can we not include programming in a virtual setting? <clears throat> you know, we found a lot of success during the pandemic um, in virtual programming. And so uh, we're just gonna keep going. To bring back our, um, this morning's keynote speaker, uh, Nick Tanzi is gonna talk about best practices for virtual and hybrid programming. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I just got a pop-up on my phone about uh, flights. I was like, oh, is it a bad thing? But it's not a bad thing. So, <laughs> so virtual programming, hybrid programming, how did we get here? I think for a lot of us, it was the pandemic kind of brought us to this. I know many of us had dabbled in virtual programming, but this was kind of the, the focal point for us and kind of the... Uh, the, the big thing that gave us that push to really dive into virtual programming. And one of the things that I find interesting about it is we, and, and I'm speaking broadly, okay, to be clear, but I know, you know, in our library, one of the things that we found was we had shut down, we had our physical location was unavailable, and we were kind of trying to make do, right? And a lot of what we did was about continuity of service. And it was with our power users in mind. We were trying to keep that story time going. We were trying to keep some of our popular exercise programs going and accidentally discovered new audiences. And we found that partially it makes me feel excited. Partially it makes me feel like we made some mistakes because we found that we could serve our community so more fully with virtual programming, and it was an area that we had ignored. I think about our homebound patrons, how much more fully their library experience could be uh, if only we had done some of the stuff sooner. So a lot of it was initially about serving continuity of service, about continuing to serve power users, and inevitably we discovered new audiences. When we talk about virtual programming though, I wanna to play to strengths. I think we probably know that we're trying to figure out that new normal and what's the proper degree to virtual programming, what's the balance between in-person programming. And sometimes we, I think, artificially try to do virtual programs. It's not always a good fit. Hybrid programming is not always a good fit. So when we do virtual programming, when we do hybrid, how do we play to their strengths? One of the things that I've discovered is and I discovered, like, I, I invented it, right? 
one of the lessons I learned was to capitalize on the immediacy of virtual. How far in advance do you have to start planning your physical newsletter? How, it's like kind of steering a, uh, a cruise ship, right? It takes a lot of lead time in order to do that. And when we pivoted to virtual, we found that we could get things out in front of our public much quicker. Uh, we were able to be more responsive. Now, there's benefits to that, there's some drawbacks to it, but one of the examples I'll give is, we had a pretty bad storm during the pandemic, took down a lot of trees, there was a lot of flooding, and then we had a forecast not too much, uh, you know, not long after that, that we knew that bad weather was coming again. And so it's obviously it's got a community's attention and it's a real need, it's a matter of safety. So we found that we could offer on the fly um, in a way that we couldn't with a print newsletter, programs on identifying hazardous trees, do it in a virtual setting and make that pivot much quicker so that was advantageous. Now, we know that there's a digital divide. We know that's part of the trick. And this type of approach, it relied on effective marketing. It relied on, and that was some of the signage in building. That was some of the uh, social media marketing. That was our e-newsletter ties very much into this. But when you're thinking about virtual programming, capitalize on that immediacy. The fact that you can respond to trends much quicker, I, I think is a sweet spot. We also use virtual as a force multiplier. We have limited space. This is a beautiful space. Um, I don't have this kind of space where I work. <laughs> virtual takes space out of the equation, right? At least as long as you're paying Zoom for the size of the room. But it also allows you to be in many places at once. And so what we used was when we're doing, for example, chair yoga classes, we have multiple senior centers we have multiple assisted living centers that are scattered throughout our community. We could do one program and we can reach all of them at once. And we work with their recreation department so that they know when these things are happening. And it's part of their offerings. So for us, it acts as a force multiplier. We do one program and it reaches many people in a way that for our outreach team would require multiple visits. We still do those, but this is another way to help get the most out of these investments. Pre-recording. Um, I think everybody thought virtual programs, it was all so easy. Remember, everybody thought we were on vacation when, uh, <laughs> when we're doing virtual. And the reality is virtual programming takes a long time. Pre-recorded programs takes a long time. I would always prefer to do it live. But when we do pre-recordings, that can give you some versatility and you need to lean into that. Guess what? Seasons, they come again. Um, holidays, they come again. So if you've already done the work on that gingerbread house assembly, right, why not reuse it? You can still come up with the craft kits all over again, but it gives you the opportunity to get the most out of that investment. It also allows you to do programs that are scalable. Sometimes you don't know how popular a program is, and then you discover it somewhat belatedly, and that is an opportunity to quickly scale up. So that's another thing that we can lean into to get the most out of virtual programming. One of my favorite things that came out of all this is just improved collaboration. We came up with all of these ad hoc consortiums. Now we have the Suffolk Cooperative Library System, that's 55 member libraries. Sometimes we work together really nice, uh, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we only work within what we call our zone, it's our immediate geographic region. And being able to just deputize four or five like-minded libraries and offer a virtual programming option allowed us to do programs that maybe were niche. Maybe for just the South Huntington Public Library, I didn't have a large enough audience to justify the cost. When you bring in other libraries and you collaborate, it all of a sudden made that, that cold calculus that we sometimes have to do, that cost per patron, much more manageable. It's also a way to engage in more expensive programming and of course spread the cost so it's not just those traditional partnerships, um, but also those ad hoc that you can create. It also creates new program partners. Uh, virtual takes distance out of, the, uh, out of the equation. Sometimes that means getting an author that you might, may not uh, be able to bring in. Sometimes it means a partner who is unable to travel or is prohibited to, you know, from traveling. That's an advantage. And then finally, with hybrid, hybrid's one of those tricky ones where just like not every program's good for virtual, 
just because you're having a physical program, recording it is not necessarily, now I have a great hybrid program, right? There's some things that we don't wanna be recorded. Um, when I'm doing an exercise class, nobody needs to see me exercise. Nobody should have to watch that. Um, I don't want to be recorded, right? So not everything is the perfect fit. However, stuff that really does work well, kind of melding the two, the in-person and the virtual, small conversations, book discussions, and also those larger ones where the talk is maybe more one-sided, that's lecture, right? And then you can engage in a Q&A. And we have found with a little bit of technology, things like Meeting Owl are very helpful for managing the active speaker in hybrid situations. So I wanna, I know we need some time now to engage in a panel discussion. That's my contact information, you've seen that before. And uh, I'll turn it over to Chris now. We're going to open it up to questions also, if, if, if anyone out there has any questions. Um, I guess um, one question that I had for all of the panelists was, how has the community need for programming changed since the opening of society after the pandemic? What are people looking for? What, do you, what have you guys noticed? Well, I just noticed, especially this uh, past summer, um, we were incredibly busy, like mo more so than we anticipated. For instance, we did a, a, an ice cream science program. The idea was bring in the kids, um, give them some cream and sugar and a Ziploc baggie with some rock salt and shake it up and ice cream science, great. Um, we ended up getting twice as many people as we anticipated. We didn't require registration for this. I think people are really nowadays trying to find ways to come back in ways that they're comfortable with um, and doing programs outside, but also um, away from the library is a great great way to do that, especially if you don't ha necessarily have a great outdoor space. Um, the branch I work at is very small and we do not have um, much in the way of outdoor space, but being able to um, bring programs to that neighborhood with Storytime in the Park, for instance, um, going to some of the local parks in that area, it has been fantastic, so. You know, sometimes we're always wondering like, what's your most popular program, right? That's the, the question we like to, uh, to answer. And oddly enough, with virtual programming, one of the real community interests has been cutting the cord um, figuring out with all these streaming services, what's the best way to do this? What's, you know, what does that look like? A lot of questions. Um, and it's part of just the changing media consumption that we have. So that's one that works very well virtually in a lecture style format. And we found that we can't offer it enough. I would like to tell about our uh, community outreach events. When we do the community outreach events, we do see the community coming up and really saying, less screen time, more fun activity, hands-on. So it's more of a family thing that they're doing and they're engaging very well. All, every, each member who's there, they are doing it as a family event. As for the schools, the teachers are very happy because we come, them, come to them and the students who would not participate because of their, whatever, groupism in this class, they say they are working well as a team. So they've seen the team building activity going on in the school after the pandemic. You want to add something then? Yeah, so when we're out to the community, underserved communities, um, some schools don't have maker space or the devices that they could use to educate the children. So since the pandemic, we've received um, a strong demand for us to visit and provide that resource for them. And are you able to meet that demand um, with just your vehicle? I would say yes, yes, because of our devices, all the, the creative programs that the librarians have implemented, it's been a successful one. And um, we're, we're fully booked for our, the school year already, and um, we hope that, the, that we can get more funding for maybe another one, another vehicle. Do you, do you like make <clears throat> an effort to visit the schools like equitably, like, like, like don't double up on one school before everyone's got a chance or something like we that? Try. We try, we try, but we, yeah, our priority is uh, um, schools that are underserved. 
but we do get like repeated requests from uh, previous schools, and um, we try to yeah we try to manage that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I've I've noticed that a lot of uh, people come in and they want hands on. They want hands on, and they want inner community. They want to like be able to relate to other people. But um, I also. I had a really successful film club um, <clears throat> that was all virtual during the pandemic, and they keep hitting me up because I ended it, and they were like, when are you gonna bring it back? When are we gonna meet again? And so I think the next step is for it to be in person, but the but there was there was a lot of success. Um, I had a lot of success virtually, and, and and I had to stop that community, and I think that they that some people lost that, that sense of community, even though it was virtual. Um, <laughs> it's tricky because sometimes for some folks it's a convenient option for some people it's the only option and you know you're, you're serving different communities with different needs um, that's part of the tricky piece and I feel like that's been a lot of this past year is figuring out what is the proper balance what is the right resource allocation because at the end of the day we have limited funds we have limited time and we're trying to navigate that appropriate split in physical and digital. Yeah. Surveys, surveys are important, but then even the survey, you gotta make sure you're reaching the folks who are underserved. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, now we have a couple more minutes left so we could take questions from the audience. So Meeting Owl is a speaker that actually will focus and broadcast the active speaker. So if you're on a Zoom call and we're at a round table, it's very good at showing the active speaker. Thank you. I think she knows what to, right? So. <laughs> I had a question for uh, Caitlin. Um, you know, like you guys are doing um, story times in the park. And so do you, like, I'm wondering if, is it, geographical and do you see people who live in that neighborhood attending that story time more or is it like the power users that come to every story time? We get a little bit of both. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes I I've anecdotally see that um, people, hey, we walked across the street and get to story time. But then again, we also have the people who come every week. We have some people who stop in when they can. Um, again, my, so my story times are on Saturdays, so people are busy. People go on vacation. People have fun things to do on Saturdays, and I'm honored that uh, anybody comes <laughs> and uh, includes us in their Saturday fun time. But uh, um, it is really cool to see people enjoying parts of the city that they've never seen before. And honestly, I, I grew up in Livermore and I'm seeing parks that I've never um, experienced before or have not since they have been um, renovated because the, a lot of the parks are, have, been, have gotten refreshed in the past few years. So it's been really nice to um, be able to meet people where they are in a lot of ways and maybe introduce people to new parts of Livermore that they have access to um, and they're welcome to be in but might not have uh, explored on their own. Awesome. Okay, well, um, Padmashri, Benjamin, Caitlin, and Nick, thank you for coming and, and giving us your expertise on programming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.